Hello everyone and welcome to this series of programming with intent. The programming with intent series is comprised of a few videos. This is the first one and I call it method design and implementation part one. Next we'll have part two and after that we'll have a class design video on class design and finally one on programming two exceptions. These are not in any particular order of precedence. In fact, programming to exceptions is probably the primary uh, principle that makes all of this happen and is probably the, the more important one. But pretty much I think every one of these is important and you can't necessarily pick one or two of these ideas. You sort of want to implement all of these ideas within your programming. The idea of programming with intent has been developed over many, many years. Pretty much, probably after my six, first six or seven years of programming, I started to find issues with maintainability and readability of my code and the, the code that uh, we developed as a team in the various teams I've been in. And I started to initially I just call it locking it down where things were becoming a little more strict and you we started to develop ideas and principles that would enforce certain rules, if you will. Over the years, these ideas or principles have become stricter and more have been added on to the idea of programming with intent. And each time I added on sort of more constraints, if you will, the the code just became, became better, cleaner, more readable, more maintainable. And so now, after about 15 years of having done this and have used the idea of programming with intent in every project since then, in production applications with various teams, multiple teams of various sizes, I find I'm now ready to present this to the masses and Maybe some of you will take these on and benefit in the same way that I have and the teams I've worked with have in the past. So as we know, methods are the foundational units of work and have a direct impact on how we reason about the code we write. Good method design leads to good class design and thus good system design and of course good API design. So the idea of programming with intent is that I want to tell a story. When I write code, I'm, I'm telling a story. I'm talking to the, the reader of my code, either my future self or other team members or future team members. I want to convey a story. And I tell people I'm not a native English speaker. I speak in C Sharp or C++ or JavaScript, Java, whatever the case may be. And so the idea is to express your intent in code and not comments. So if you find yourself having to write comments for something, you probably missed either the, the name of the methods that you're calling are not conveying their intent clearly. The names of local variables or uh, method arguments are not named correctly. So I would say express your intent in code and talk to me. And that's kind of like how I see it. And of course, a big driver for this is maintainability, readability, and comprehension of the, the code we write, especially after a while, not right away, but potentially two, three, a year, two, three months later, a year later. So tell me a story. Don't make me think. The code should convey very clearly what it is doing, not necessarily how. Uh, if there were your first intention is to ensure you're conveying what the code is doing. The hows can be delegated to, let's call it secondary or tertiary methods. And we'll talk about that when we talk about um, the uh, levels of abstraction in part two of this method design series. So don't make me think is about letting the story flow without me having to stop to think about like what is it that you're doing here the coach should speak to me don't make me wonder is probably one of the the bigger reasons for why 
this idea of programming with intent was developed, which is essentially trying to remove ambiguity in the way we write code. So when you write code, it expresses something. In some people's mind, the code you know they've written is clear. But if you were to kind of really digest that code, you'd find that there are ambiguities there, and you were, we're trying to remove these ambiguities. Most of the ambiguities come from uh, the idea of reuse, unfortunately. Now, even though I'm a big proponent of reuse, I don't believe trying to reuse everything every time is the right approach. And it, this drive to reuse code is actually making the code less uh, less uh, comprehensible. So the ambiguities are arising from two aspects. One is trying to reuse code, but I think a bigger part is when we don't want to do the proper analysis, when we don't want to think too hard about the code we are writing. For example, when you have a conditional and you're testing for some conditional, simple things like you know null or empty, or you're costing something using an as instead of a cost, it's implying to me that you're not thinking about hard enough about what it is you're doing and whether those scenarios even exist. And can you in some way reduce that test, either eliminate the test or reduce it to a single test? For example, is null or empty two tests? And why is it a null or an empty? Why cannot it just be one of them? Does, is it even one of them? So you're having to think about the code you write and you're trying to ensure yeah, the aim is to remove conditionals and second, secondarily to remove kind of these ambiguous conditionals. You know, when you use an as instead of a cost, you're telling me something. When you're using a null or empty or null, empty or white space, you're telling me something and maybe that can be confined to different or uh, fewer things. Just a null check or something of that nature. And we'll get deeper into that. So that's the don't make me wonder. Methods are, if methods are designed well, they clearly express our intent to the caller. So it's, it's all about writing code that very clearly expresses our intent to the caller and that intent is exacting. It's not about ifs, thens, maybe, what ifs. I'll just be safe, so I'll do this. That's the chunk of don't make me wonder, don't make me think. It, it's all about being extremely exacting in the way you write code, so your, your intents are expressed. And if you are not able to get there, then you should be striving to do that so that you're leaving less ambiguities in your code. Methods that, that are designed and implemented well clearly express our intent to the maintainer and our future selves, make it easier for maintainers of our future, maintainers or our future selves to comprehend and are typically more efficient. Now that efficiency may bring about you know, minor performance Im improvements, but by efficient, I mean, you're just using less resources and therefore less, there's less code potentially. And so these methods are just cleaner and more efficient. <laughs> Another big comp proponent of, or the driver for programming with intent has been this, who the heck wrote that moments. When you, when you see code you've written, in, in the past or somebody else has written on your team or just generally you're reading some some code that you've not written and don't probably don't know who wrote it. You're, if you have these moments where you, you know, who the heck wrote that and other, you know, WTF moments, that's what we are trying to eliminate here. Especially, you know, I, I don't want to be the kind of the, on the receiving end of that either because I've written the code myself and I'm sort of cursing myself two, three years later uh, or within the team itself, you know, in, in the current moments. So that's the other driver for programming with intent. Names are everything. Names of classes, names of properties, names of methods, formal argument names, and the, the type names, which is the class names, and the actual parameter names, local variables. What happens, what I've found is when you're implementing a certain method, then you're sort of let's call it struggling with implementing it and getting it right. So you're not you're not thinking so much about readability or maintainability at the point. You're simply trying to get it to work, right? So that's sort of the main focus at that initial stage. And once you've got it to work, you've written 
a bunch of tests uh, accounting for the different scenarios that that method is supposed to implement or account for. And then you should go back to this method, not only just refactor from the perspective of refactoring and cleaning up your code, but also renaming. What I found is I would, I mean, I spent an, an inordinate amount of time coming up with names for methods and classes and local variables and such. I mean, it's a huge amount of time, but that time is extremely well spent. And this refactoring I'm talking about, you should be rethinking names of, let's say, local variables, names of the method itself and the formal arguments. And any classes you might have used, you want to rethink the name. Is this class really doing what I thought it was going to be doing, you know, in the initial stage? I've even found sometimes, you know, two, three months later, I'm working in a different area of the system. And then over there, I'm calling this method. And I have, I will go back and rename the method correctly, because now I probably have an even better understanding. Or it's not quite making a lot of sense to me today, you know, after two, three months. So don't be afraid of refactoring or changing names of classes, properties, formal arguments, local variables, stuff like that. I mean, Today's IDEs make it really, really simple, so there's absolutely no reason to to fear that. But think about it. if somebody else on the team has an issue, what they don't quite understand what this method is doing, then that's a signal, right? So take these signals as a reason to improve or change names of things so that they are clearer and they express their intent. The way we write code is not the way we read code is what I tell people. You know, you, you write code one way, but when you want to read it, it's you, you, you can't read it the way you wrote it. So you need to refactor that. And of course, we write code once and we read it, you know, probably over a thousand times. So you're focusing more on the human reader that's going to be reading this code from the point from that point forward. We're not writing code for somewhere else I read in the book. We don't write code for a compiler, we write code for the human being. Right? So that's the other aspect of reading, uh, na naming things correctly. Methods, <coughs> method names should always use the vocabulary of the business, domain, business. And by business, I don't mean like a business system. It could be a game. It could be whatever the business of the, the software you're writing. Right? They should use the vocabulary of the business class names, method names, formal argument names, local variable names, all of these should follow the language of the domain or the vocabulary of the domain. And that's important because that way you're, if you're working with analysts or your customers directly, then you can have the same language and your code is reflecting exactly what you're listening to or hearing and learning about the business, your ability of the system you're building. And so it all pans out. If at any point in time you you don't understand or don't know a specific name for the uh, business name for or something you're doing, then go back to the analyst and talk to them and or talk to the customer and try and get a sense of what would they call this thing that you're thinking about and then give it that name. Methods should start their life as private. Now in C Sharp when you don't explicitly specify an access modifier two methods, they are private by default. However, programming with intent is about, you know, showing your intent, expressing your intent. So you should explicitly mark your methods with the private access modifier to show your future self and others on the team that you intended for this method to be private. It wasn't private by fluke, you know, just because I want this method to be private. If methods are private, they can always be made protected or public in the future, but you can't go backwards as in you can't make a public method protected or private because you potentially break something. Somebody's already using that method or so you're already using this method somewhere else. So you always get the benefit if you need to make something private. And hopefully when you're trying to make something public in the future, you're thinking hard about making it you know less or more accessible and so because you're seeing this you would know that you've done this by intent and so are you sure you want to make it protected or, or private and I call this idea we don't expose our privates and so that's the basic premise for this 
public and internal methods should not be virtual. Now this is a C sharp design guideline where they're saying if you have the, the desire or a need to make a method virtual, by virtual I mean virtual or abstract, and that method also happens to be public, then don't make that method virtual, the public method virtual. What you do instead is you have a method by the same name but with a suffix of core and then you forward that call on to that method and this core method can be protected or yeah protected so that's sort of the, the guidelines and I use this a lot in fact not a lot I use it everywhere and it is there is a security risk to making public methods virtual so that's the reason the guideline exists methods once overridden should be sealed now when we talk about class design you'll be saying classes start their lives as internal sealed. So if classes are sealed, then the methods that are overridden in that class are automatically sealed. But if you ever have a situation where the class is not sealed or you don't want the class to be sealed, you might want to think about some of these virtual methods and sealing them until such a time that you intentionally wanted to override those methods. Right? In other words, typically when you descend from a let's say a base class, the descendant class is sealed to start with, and so then that that problem doesn't occur. But if you ever unseal that class, then you might want to think about it. Methods should be autonomous. Autonomous is what I call self-standing methods. Basically, what it says is that methods should ask for all the data they need via its formal arguments the method should not use any other information prior to calling this method. A lot of times you people would set properties to an object and then call a method on the object. So the properties are kind of maintaining that state in that object and then you call the method. So it's not clear by looking at the method signature that this method needs or requires you to have set you know x number of properties prior to calling the method. So don't do that. Essentially the method itself should ask for all the data it needs via the formal arguments. So an auto autonomous method is a method that sort of stands by itself. It doesn't require you to have set other properties before you call it. Okay. Methods should be pure. Now if you're familiar with functional programming, in, in functional programming they have the same idea of methods being pure, but their, their ideas are a bit stricter. In their mind, so in the notion of pure functions in functional programming is that methods operate on all the arguments so methods will ask for all the uh, data they require via their formal arguments and methods do not may, uh, change state the notion of changing state is anything like making a database update or making a service call or writing to the console or writing to the file system that's all state change so pure functions don't change state. Now an imperative programming language like C sharp or C++ or Java, uh, I'm not sure I can be that strict. So there's a not necessarily a compromise but the way I see it is this. You have a system, let's say there's this class A that talks to these two classes and this one talks to these two classes and so on. Then the classes that change state are confined to the leaf nodes or the perimeter of your system, the, the boundaries you know, of your system, which leaves you with all the other classes within the system to be where methods are pure and autonomous. Right? So it's only the leaf nodes, the classes that are at the leaf nodes, whose methods are autonomous but not pure. And this is kind of like how I've been building systems. So it just happens that these leaf nodes are the ones that make the state changes. The rest of the classes in the system are sort of pure. They don't make, they don't rely on state and they don't change state. Now they may be the instrumental in making the state change this state change happen, but this class in itself is not changing state. It's this class that's doing the actual state change of these classes, the leaf nodes. Methods should be provided with the bare minimum information, nothing more nothing less. I call this the need-to-know basis. So the idea is to 
when you design your method signatures that the formal arguments instead of formal arguments are the bare minimum information that method requires in order to perform the the function that it claims to do do for you nothing less and nothing more of course nothing less you'd know right away but nothing more is sort of the more important one methods that are actions or commands should be void returning now both of these are going to kind of wake you up i guess when you when you understand what the implications of these are it, it some people might find it a bit jarring and <laughs> that's the intent the intent is that as i said some of these things kind of seem to go con contrary to what you probably know of or believe in or have been doing for a number of years so just just bear me with me and once you start to see some examples and if you once you start to follow these principles yourselves you'll you'll actually get this idea so actions and commands are methods that do something i call them the doers so if a method is doing something it has no reason to send you back some information now most times when people return something from an action kind of command uh, method it's a indicator of success or failure so essentially what i'm saying is action should not be returning success or failure indication but nonetheless they should not be returning and you know so they should be returning a void instead of returning something now there is probably one anomaly in this whole thing which is let's say you're inserting a customer and the set of formal arguments is asking for the information in required in order to create a customer and this method returns to you the id of the newly created customer so that's the sort of the the anom anom anomalous aspect of this one principle but it's also the one case that i've found or you know by one case i don't mean just customer but something similar to the same thing where you have a need to return the id of this newly created resource but even if you did that you're not returning the id or a minus 1 to indicate a success or a failure right if there was a failure you're not returning and that'll be discussed later on so the method is returning something but that something is returned in the case of a success and you're not using the same type let's say it's an integer that's being returned to indicate a success or a failure methods that are query should only return the data they claim or not return at all and by not returning at all i mean you throw an exception so when you throw an exception the the execution does not reach the call site right so if you call the method and the method throw an exception it doesn't come back to you right it is gone it's kind of rolled up the the call stack so when i mean not return at all i mean the method throws an exception so so if a method claims to return something it should return only the data it claims or not return so for example you have this method here i'm just keeping it simple this get customer method claims to return a customer provided you gave it an id of some sort and let's say for some reason that let's take the happy path so if you call this method it returns to your customer you can execute the the next line without fear without wondering anything so the the opposite the other scenario is the get customer can't give you this customer it can't find some customer with an id of 42 so what does it do so of course this is like a like a query method so query methods should either return what they claim they return or not return at all right so in this case this method should throw an exception and then look at this code here so if execution reaches this point i can be sure that everything before this line was successful there's no way i can come to this line of code unless all prior lines of code have executed successfully and that's the premise of programming to exceptions which we'll talk about when we look at that video so if methods don't return at all you don't have to wonder about what to do in case it's not giving you back what you asked for Right, so it totally simplifies the code. This whole idea of action methods and query methods, you know, when when the one case query methods, they don't return at all if they can't give you the data they claim to. And similarly with action methods, where let's say this was an insert customer, 
right? So you're expecting an ID back for this new customer. And what if there was a problem with inserting a customer? Well, it does not return. Like it doesn't return to you a status or some sort of indication of success or failure where you have to check to see something if you can proceed. You simply proceed after you got this new customer, you do what you have to do with this new customer without the one, without the fear or without having to wonder about how will I proceed with that scenario. Right? So the conditions have just disappeared. If you're not used to programming to exceptions or if you if you feel exceptions are bad or they, they, you, know, you fear them, of course, you're having a hard time digesting this. But trust me, this once you understand programming to exceptions and once you don't fear exceptions and you embrace exceptions and treat them as your friends, everything gets cleaned up. There are very few conditionals in the code I write as compared to somebody else who would write the same code. <clears throat> That's not to say that there are no conditions. I'm just saying there are much fewer conditionals because of this sort of scenario. I don't have to wonder if the method before me did, is, did, did the right thing. If the method, if the lines of code before this line of code failed, I won't even get here. Execution won't reach here. So I'm not even concerned. I'm not, that whole case has been eliminated from all of my code. Given these, the earlier principles, some people come up, you know, the clever people, <laughs> will come up with this a class like this where the class has a property called customer, which is of type customer, and another property that you know could call, be called anything else that's giving you some sort of error information back. And they're saying, well, you know, my, my method claims to be returning an option, so it is doing what you said. And I'm, I'm this is not what I'm saying. You're not trying to beat the system, right? So if a method claims to return a customer, or that's the intention of this method to return to your customer, then don't return an object option or some some sort of a union. There are different names for this this uh, design pattern. Yeah, and so don't don't do this. Right? Don't don't try and beat the system. I'm sort of keeping it simple, but don't try and find holes in what I'm saying and come up with clever solutions or options or alternatives. Now so far I'm hoping I'm all I've already kind of made you wonder. Like you're not quite sure how this is going to work, and am I even serious about what I'm saying? I am dead serious. I have been using these, this style of programming for many, many, many years. It's never failed me. It's never caused any issues. In fact, compared to other teams that I've been working with, our systems have been flawless. I don't mean completely flawless. What I mean is just far fewer issues in production. So I am very serious. Now, of course, the principles I've discussed so far and the principles you'll hear me discuss further on from here will feel like they're somewhat going against the grain or they counter common practice. You know, we're always following common practices. We're always looking on it to see what others are doing in our field and trying to follow these, these common practices. And almost everything I'm going to tell you in this series of programming with intent is is going to be going counter to common practice, at least for a lot of you. Some of you have probably already deviated from this common practice without realize, realizing it, so you're already doing some of these things. But for the most part, they are backwards from common practice. And what I'm going to tell you is common practice is not common sense. Common practice is just that. It's a practice that people do a lot. It doesn't make it right. It, may, it doesn't make it the correct way to do things. It just means people have been doing it for a while. I won't belabor this point by giving you all kinds of examples, but I'm sure if you thought about some of the common practices within your your culture, within your families, within your programming community and other walks of life, you'll realize there are a lot of things people do that doesn't imply it's correct. So the idea that I've been applying uh, within my thought process is I want to think from first principles. What that means is you distill things down to their fundamental truths and you start from there. You're always asking the question, why? Why is it not this instead of that? And you're, as a beginner programming programmer, you're, you're sort of following other people's guidance. So, and that's typically in this realm of common practice. But you get to a certain stage where you start to have questions. If you're not asking questions within, say, the first 
few years of your programming career, you're not quite thinking hard enough about what it is you're doing. You're just following along without question. So what I would say is always ask questions. Ask yourself questions. Why am I doing this? Is there another way to do this? Why am I, why, why am I being told to do that? It's not like you're trying to be a rebel, but you're honestly asking this question. Why? Why not this? How about that? Can I do this another way? And it, it comes from thinking from first principles. You're trying to achieve something here, and there's a common practice for it. But how did it get to the, this common practice? Right? There was something that started at that level of the first principles, then it kind of walked its way up, and finally here's a common practice. So essentially what I'm saying is, rather than trust somebody else's kind of route to get to the common practice, you should try it yourself. You should start with first principles and distill things down to their fundamental truths and come back up to where you're, what you're trying to do. Always ask questions. Always ask questions. I don't mean questions in, by way of trying to be argumentative or rebellious. Honest questions. You ask yourselves honest questions about what it is you're doing, why you're doing it, why is there another way to do this, a better way to do this, an alternative way. You don't know it's better or worse until you actually try it, and you might discover that this alternative is better. But better, of course. You have to be in a, in a position to know it's better or worse. So here, take this one. I can't tell you how many places and how many times I've read this guidance that says validate, methods should validate all their formal arguments. I mean, I've seen this in source code and off libraries in large companies or even open source projects. I'm not, I don't, I don't believe in this idea. I'm not a proponent of validating for, for formal arguments. Now there's, there are a few principles that I'll talk about right after this that will explain why I would not validate formal arguments. But the basic idea is this. Caveat emptor, which means buyer beware. This is it's coming from law where they have this idea of caveat emptor. But I'm applying this or using this in this fashion. If somebody's calling my method and my method clearly indicates in the signature what it needs, but if the caller didn't send me the right information, it's not my problem. Buyer beware. Right, so if I have a reference type, let's say it's a string parameter, and the caller sent me a null, oh, too bad, it's not my problem. I'm not going to check to do anything. I'm going to proceed as if you send me the right information, and if there's a problem because you send me the wrong information, it's your problem. Right? And But if you extrapolate that, that throughout your system, you suddenly find that nobody has to do any validation. And I'll, I'll get that get to that in the next slide. So I have this idea. <laughs> if you lock the front door and you lock the back door, you're safe in the house. So you don't have to look under the bed, behind the doors, in the closet or wherever else this boogeyman may be. Right, so if you lock your front door and you lock your back door, you're safe in the house. What that means is you, you validate and clean up every piece of data that comes into your system no matter where it comes from. Typically, the front door meaning like a UI, the back door meaning like a service call or file system or a database or something, right? So, but it doesn't matter. Any entry point into your system, wherever the data comes from, the first thing you do is you clean up and validate the data. If you don't like it, throw it out. Throw an exception. There's no need to entertain bad data coming into your system and then everyone in the system, every class in your system is now not able to trust the data it's operating on. So now if we follow this principle of locking the front door and locking the back door, then you're safe in the house. Right? So if your data is coming from a UI or from a database or an external service call or a file system, before that data enters the system, it has been cleaned up, it's been validated and cleaned up. Like what I mean by clean up, right? So if it's, let's say, a string parameter, you're cleaning it up so you say, okay, if there are spaces, you're cleaning up the spaces. If you're left with a, with a string with a length of zero, you've made it a null. It's been cleaned up. And now if the null is not valid, by the time it comes in here, you can just blindly throw an exception when that happens. Right? So 
if every one of us plays, everyone on the team plays this game of locking the front door and locking the back door, then we are safe in the house. Then every class and every method can trust every other method. Nobody has to worry about bad data coming in through method arguments. So of course, these entry points of your system, the front door and the back door, you do need to clean up and validate your data. So <clears throat> in the cleanup process, you're using, let's say, one of these different things. You're using a is null or empty check. Now, with these tests, with these conditional tests, at least these two, what I'm trying to get at is in like in, in my systems, a string has only two values. It's either null or a valid value. <clears throat> the idea of string dot empty or a string with a length of empty zero does not exist. So as part of cleaning up, what we're doing is as soon as the data comes in, we clean it up. And the result of that could be one of two things. It's either a valid string. Now you don't know if it's valid from the perspective of data valid, but it's valid in terms of it's not three states. It's not a potentially a, a string that's empty or a string that has a bunch of spaces or blanks, you know, anywhere or trailing and leading uh, spaces. It's either a valid string or it's a null. So by cleaning up, that's what I mean. You're cleaning up the data coming in. And then the first thing you would do is after you've cleaned up is you validate. That validation occurs at the entry point. And that validation is, let's call it business centric validation. Whatever that means to the business. Is it valid according to the business, right? But within the system, past the front door and the back door, you're, you don't have the idea or the notion of a string being empty because if it were empty at the time you clean it up, it would be null. Then you don't have a need to do a is null or empty check. So by being, when you programming with intent is saying, well, don't do an unnecessary check. Don't use the string is null or empty in cases when you know it's never null or empty. It's either null or it's empty. Right? In our case, it's never empty. Therefore, it's always null. So we can use a null check, but we're not using a is null or empty check. You're not leaving you're not writing code that is ambiguous. You're writing code that is exacting. It's intentful. And you're saying, I know at this point, this string will never be empty. Therefore, I only need to check for a null. Right? So you're making your intent clear. So I'm not wondering when I'm reading this code, like, is it null or is it empty? Why is it null or empty? Like, when is it empty? You know, the, these questions you ask yourself when you're looking at code. And the same goes for null or white space. Right? If you if you've cleaned up the data up front, if it's a string, then you first you've trimmed it, let's say, and I'll we we'll talk about trim in the next slide. But let's say you, you've trimmed it, then it's left with uh, length zero, then you make it null. So you've cleaned it up. Again, this is, there's no reason for is null or white space. Now it so happens that both these methods are fairly expensive in that they have extra memory allocations happening behind the scenes and new strings are being created so you're saving that as well a null check has got no memory allocations you're just saying is it null that's it and of course as i said if within the cleaning up areas of your code when you're at the you know your front door and the back door rather than doing a test to see if the string is null or empty just do a length check because you know it's if it's a length zero you'll make it a null it's also more efficient so as part of this cleaning up process, you would have, let's say in the case of strings, you'll have these options. And even here, you want to make your intent extremely clear. You want to you not leave ambiguities in your mind or questions, you know, don't make me wonder, don't make me think. So trim would potentially be used in the case of user input because users may inadvertently enter spaces before and after the data they typed in but then use trim only in those cases. You're making your intent clear. I'm using a trim here because I know I'm intentfully using a trim here because I know that there's a potential for data to be the, uh, leading and trading spaces to exist. Let's say you're working with a database and you're retrieving data from a database and this database, this column happens to be a, a char column and the data in that column doesn't fully occupy the, the width of the char column. Then you will get uh, padded spaces at the end. In that case, use a trim right. Don't use a trim. 
don't use the trim left, use the trim right. You make your intentions clear. You're saying by using a trim right, yes, I know I need to clean up the data, and but guess what? The only data I need to clean up is the trailing spaces. I'm not going to use a trim in those situations to make my intention clearer. I'll use the trim right. So if you're using these things in your front door and back door, then use even them within these things, use the ones that are more explicit in your intent. All right, so these are mainly to do with link. Now, link is a fantastic feature in, in the .NET languages. It's a very useful library of capability. However, it is expensive. The many things you do in link that appear to be simple are actually extremely expensive and slower than if you didn't use link. That's not to say you shouldn't use link, but be careful when you use link and especially when it comes to programming with intent, be careful of some of these things. Not careful, I mean be very intentful. Now what I found is people use a tool list and a tool array just because. Not sure, I don't know, but you know, I'll sort of be safe. I, I know I've had to use it in some cases, some points, I've not quite understood why I need to do a tool list or a tool array, so I'll just do a tool list or a tool array everywhere, right, to be on the safe side. That's wrong. Don't do that because these methods are expensive. They're allocating completely new collections. So it not only really does it take your time, but it takes up a lot of memory. So if you need, first of all, if you don't need to use these, don't just start to write the tool list or the tool array at the end of your, let's say, your link queries. Determine you actually have to use it or it'll be beneficial for you to use it before you just write them blindly. In many, many cases I found people when I'm doing code reviews, we can just take it out. There's no impact. There's no side effect either. Like for example, you know, I know with with that thing with EF, it sort of makes sense to use a tool list or a tool array because if you don't, it's going to go back to the database and execute the query. If you happen to use the result more than once, but okay, I'm assuming you understand, you know, how that works, and so you know whether we need to remove the tool list or the tool array that there is or there is no impact, no side effect. But the benefit would be that if you're using Toolus and Toure just because, just to be safe, I'm not quite sure, but I'll do it anyways, you know, kind of mentality, then you're potentially gaining a lot of efficiencies, uh, performance, less memory allocations and such. So think many, many times before doing the Toolus or the Toure. Single versus the first. Again, I think these are both great methods However, I think people, they use them incorrectly and some of it is just the fear of getting exceptions. I think for the most part, you know, we, we write the safe code with the fear that we don't want to deal with an exception, right? So we, we write, we do all these kind of checks and balances just to be safe, just in case. And that's, I think, where the problem starts <laughs> is writing code without being absolutely sure or without wanting to do the sort of the, the hard work of discovering, asking questions of the analysts of the business or yourselves if you're building your own system. Like, when are these scenarios ever going to occur? And will are these scenarios even valid? Or am I just unnecessarily writing code when the scenarios don't exist? Right? So, single means you expect exactly one record after the criteria that you've applied. Not none and not more than one. Exactly one. First implies that there could potentially be more than one, but you're only interested in the one. So use these appropriately. Don't be, you don't use first just to be on the safe side, right? That, that whole idea <coughs> causes us a lot of trouble. Then you make me wonder when I look at the code. There are many, many situations. In fact, the, the current project I'm working on is sort of fraught with this, where, you know, the business of the analyst will tell us, you know, if you apply this criteria, you should get one record and we say, are you sure it's exactly one record? And they'll say, yep, I think it should be one record. Okay. Then we'll write the code using single. And then at some point in time, if it does blow up, and it does, you go back to the analyst and say, well, you know, you told me in this criteria, if I applied this criteria, I'll get exactly one record, but now I'm getting either more or I'm getting none. And they'll have to go back to the drawing board and give you the proper analysis. Don't take the easy way out. Don't take the shortcuts, the conveniences. Be very explicit when you use these methods. What is the requirement? If the requirements are not clear, get them to be made clear. Talk to the customers, 
understand them and be explicit. And you know, as I said in this last the current project I'm working on, we've done this many, many times. It's, it seems like it's extra work in the beginning of the sort of the project, but you will thank yourselves by the time that system goes to production. It'll you'll be just completely fraught of sorry, free of these issues and ambiguities. I mean there's a lot to say about this. I can go for a whole day talking about these two. Prefer single over single or default and prefer first over first or default for the same reason. I mean when you're using single or default, what are you saying exactly? And I'm not saying that th these scenarios don't exist or they don't occur. They surely, I mean of course there are cases in the, in business even after doing all the analysis that you need to use a single or default. But then use it in the appropriate places, right? You're programming with intent. Show me your intent. So if all of us programming program with intent, then when I see you using a first or I see you using a sorry, single or a first or a single or default, I'm not guessing, right? I trust you're doing the same thing, I'm doing the same thing. So when I see you using single or default, I'm just going with that with the idea that this will be either a single or none, no records. So if we, if everyone on the team plays this game, this the the code gets cleaned up. Now, one of the issues I have with single and other, you know, single or default is that, so if, if, if I use the single method and the result of the query is more than one record, when I say query, I don't mean, I don't use EF, so I'm meaning uh, link to objects, if you will. So if the result of the, the criteria is more than one, then single will throw an exception. If there is no result, single will throw an exception. I'm okay with exceptions. But what I don't like about that those methods, I don't get the opportunity to provide any more information when something goes wrong. So you will typically get a, a exception message that says sequence contains more than one record or some some such thing, which is useless. I don't know like what okay what were the parameters I used, the criteria I used, their values, and like what actually happened. So I have this method like this. Let's call it single else exception. So even the original single method basically would throw an exception, but just to disambiguate the, the two methods, single else exception gives the caller the opportunity to provide additional error message information. So this would be typically the the criteria that we use in the, their values at the time of calling single else exception. And what this method does is if it's, ne if it's not exactly one record, it throws an exception. So if the if there are zero records, it has this message, like a prefix that says no matching rows were found. We were expecting exactly one record. In the case where it was more than one, the count was more than one, then we say we were expecting exactly one record, but we found X records. And the the error message that you passed in here is uh, appended to the prefix. So we get, the, we get the exception, except this time we also get to control the information in the exception and we get to control the kind of exception that gets thrown. These are what we what I call business exceptions. So in our systems typically we have at a high level these two primary kind of branches of exceptions, technical exceptions and business exceptions. So this is a business exception because but actually, you know, you're doing something business related here and the, you know the analyst might say use this criteria to get this one record back, but we get either no records or we get more than one, that's a problem. Now, you'll find these problems, you know, at your, during your testing phases, so it's not like you're gonna to go to production and find these issues. But when you find the problem, you have enough information to give the analyst saying, hey, you know, you I applied these criteria with this, these values and I got more than one record back. And they can tell you whether their analysis was incorrect or they'll give you maybe an additional criteria to use to kind of filter it down further. So the onus is on you to kind of ask those hard questions of the analyst or of the customer or even if you're building the system for yourself. You want to ask yourself these hard questions so you can program with intent. You're not leaving things to chance. You're not writing code just in case so it's too hard for me to think about this. I'll just kind of write this, you know, to be on the safe side. All right, switching gears a little bit. Here's some sample code and uh, I want to show you how you would refactor this using some of the principles we've learned off thus far. So just watch these different conditionals. 
statements, I mean. And this is, you see, I'll send code like this that I find when I'm doing code reviews, I'll send this to the team. Of course, it's sort of anonymous. Nobody quite knows who wrote the code, but okay, except for the person that wrote the code. And I'll send this, you know, and ask them, like, hey, what's wrong with this code? And then the team will start to respond. So uh, this is what's wrong, and that's what's wrong. And so this is like an exercise uh, we do on, like, on a regular basis, not just this, but anytime I see code that could have been written with more intent, you know, less, uh, more clear, I'll say what's wrong with this code and send it out. So the idea is, starting with this one, you know, there's some... The analyst probably give us this this requirement saying if the if this timestamp is equal to the max date or the timestamp is equal to the min date, then the expiration date is equal to this. Nothing nothing wrong with this. Uh, it's very readable, of course. But what's lost is what is what does this mean to the business? I, I can see the C sharp code and I can read it perfectly, but I don't quite understand the business implications of this the conditional check. So then you go back to the analyst and say, hey, you know, you told me if this timestamp is this or that, then do this. But what does this mean to the business? And you kind of do that for all these kind of conditions that they might have given you as part of the requirements. And when you find out from them, and, you know, sometimes they don't know what it's called. And you say, no, but like, you know, maybe you want to go talk to other people in the business and kind of get a sense of what this means. I want to know what the business would call this criteria, this condition, right? Because they have a rule for it. And when you refactor this method, you'll end up with something like this. So what we found is that that initial criteria that was here is if policy tab record has no expiration activity timestamp. Of course, this seems wordy, but I've intentionally used the kind of the full form in the business, uh, these acronyms like activity timestamp they are well-known acronyms and we've used that in the method names, but I've sort of just expanded it over here. So if policy tab record has expiration activity timestamp, given this criteria, then expiration date is equal to this. Now this reads, this tells me a story. I'm not wondering, you're not making me think. I, I'm, it's just flowing. I don't need to know how that's done using this parameter. I'm just I'm trying to understand what. I said at this point at this level of abstraction, I'm not concerned with the sort of the details, the minutia of how it's done. What I want to know right away is what's being done. So I can see that this is being done. So all these methods have now got more business-centric names, as in determined by having asked the analyst or the customer the what that criteria means to them. And then the method gets all the information it requires and nothing more, nothing less. So because remember these names are typically using the acronyms that are well known by the, by the business. So even like this OOS is actually a well known and understood acronym in the business. I've just used it here since it was getting quite a bit longer. So the idea is to what I call, or I think other people also call this encapsulate conditionals. You're taking conditional statements like this and you're encapsulating these conditionals into more meaningful uh, method names to explain to the reader what it is you're trying to do and not how you're doing it. And of course, going back to one of the other principles, method names should have or use the vocabulary of the business, right? So, the, so all of these methods, conditional statements have been refactored to have method names that convey the, the intention from the perspective of the business, of the, you know, the domain. And you're not left with trying to understand how. You only have to understand at this stage what. A few other things to, to call out here. One is this, uh, the date in the original code. <coughs> this has <coughs> been initialized to a min date. And I, I, I actually find this confusing as why would you do that? Like, is it not min date already? I mean, if I were sure before, I'm all confused now. <laughs> Uh, I believe sonar uh, or you know code analysis, one of those or maybe both of them, flagged this as a useless uh, initialization or a useless assignment. So for the case of date times, this is actually is is uh, useless. The other thing is, if you haven't noticed here, we have this other method that says get data as string or null, right? So 
it's not a string or empty or, or something else. It's a null. Because in our minds, a string having a null value or a null string being null is valid. It either is null or it's it contains a valid value. There's no in between. So all our methods will ensure that at no point in time do we let the boogeyman in the house. <laughs> By that I mean you don't end up having a string dot empty somewhere now I have to deal with within the system an empty string scenario, a null string scenario, and a valid string value scenario. Right? So this is a null returning. And this method returns a null. The caller is completely accepting of the null. It expects that's part of our kind of business, if you will. By business, I don't mean this point now with the customer business, but within the system, nulls are valid in the cases of string. They're either null or they're valid values. So null is a valid value in the case of a string. So we return a null, or we return the the date represented as a string, right? And from that point forward, the the system can handle nulls and do what it needs to do. The other thing is, it may not be apparent here, of course, since you don't see all of the code. This value object or DTO data transfer object has about 150 odd properties to it, while this method just needs, I think, about five of these properties. Some are, most of them are date times. Some of them are the these codes. So maybe it's six properties. So what I've done, and then I refactored it. I've defined a new type. And so don't be a, don't be afraid to define new types and don't get lazy about this stuff. Define a new type. Assign those values. So this this type only has the properties required by this by these this entire method, and then. Though instead of having 150 properties at, uh, available to this method, you are providing a method with only the information it needs, nothing more, nothing less. Right? So it's very explicit. So as a designer of this method, I should have designed this method to ask for it only what it needs. And as a, somebody who's calling this method, I would then question, like, what do you need all my 150 you know, properties for? What are you doing exactly with this thing? And the way I tell people about this is, imagine you went to a store to buy something, and you get to the counter with this thing in your hand, and this, the uh, person at the counter says, that'll be $20. So what do you do? You take out your wallet and hand the wallet over to the, the cashier and say, you know, take what you want. <laughs> or would you take out the $20 from your wallet and hand that $20 to the cashier? Right? So that's the difference here. On the one side, as the buyer, you want to make sure methods are not being given any more information than they need. When you design an API, same thing. Ask for the bare minimum information in your APIs as well. So method design, class design, API design, they're all the same. Everything is a method. Every place we write code in our systems is in a method somewhere. So that was the other change that was made here. So here's another method. Then I've got these two implementations. It's the same name, same method, just refactored. So here's one implementation. There's a bunch of code here that I've elided. So it's returning an XML node, but you don't see that happening anywhere. So which one is better, A or B? A. Or B. <laughs> I feel like an optometrist. <laughs> is one better or two? <laughs> anyway, so these are the, the two different implementations. Now this was the original, and as you can see here, this string has been initialized to the value of no, and this string has been initialized to string dot empty, and then conditionally, uh, these two values are being set to something else. Did you notice the boogeyman here? You let the boogeyman in. <laughs> At least that's how I see it. Like if, if somebody breaks the rules, they've let they let the boogeyman in. So that's not gonna work. Like you don't want, want that. You don't want to have suddenly empties appearing from within the house. Right? If you've locked the front door and locked the back door, you don't want to, to let the boogeyman in the house and everyone is safe in the house provided everyone plays the same game. Otherwise, the boogeyman is in the house and you've locked the front door and back door. Not good. No place to run. <laughs> so, this is the better implementation where the two variables have been initialized to null. And this is a good practice. And I tell people, don't 
unnecessarily allocate memory. Strings are, of course, a memory allocation on the heap. They have to obviously be garbage collected. Over here, what's happened is you initialize this variable to some memory, and then right away, you throw it away. So this memory allocation was useless. This memory allocation is useless too because you, you, know, you assigned, you've allocated memory, you've allocated an empty string, but an allocation did occur only to throw it away and look at this method here. You've got a method that says get date as string or null. So an empty was never even a valid value. So what is the point? Now, people make mistakes. I'm not saying you wouldn't make a mistake like this, but certainly you want to look this, look back at this. And certainly if you have code reviews, that's where you kind of block all these things, right? So when people are kind of in the, in the thick of writing the logic for the, for the methods, they are not potentially paying attention to all of these different principles unless they've gone back and reviewed their code before sending out a code review. So you use code reviews as a way to, to block some of these things that got missed or, or left behind. So this is the uh, this is the correct way to have implemented that method. And as you notice, if you notice here, this conditional here, if you haven't noticed, there's a sort of conditional here, that's been encapsulated and extracted to another method and it seems that that conditional meant determine if driver is good student. So again, very clear. What am I doing? This is what I'm doing. How am I doing it? I don't want to know. It's not happening here. I don't want to get cluttered with that over here. So it's at a different level of abstraction. And of course, here's that method implemented exactly the same way, giving it exactly the information it requ requires. Nothing more, nothing less. All right. So encapsulate conditionals. We already talked about that. No unnecessary memory allocations, which is like the, the case of the strings, but I'm not talking about just strings, just anything. No extra memory allocations. So think about that and make sure you don't have unnecessary memory allocations. Avoid testing the same conditional more than once. This is, I'm sure a lot of you follow this idea. If you find yourself doing that, something needs to be refactored. Maybe you have to use polymorphism or some other solution to this problem the solution is not to keep having conditional statements that are repetitive. Conditional statements are where all the bugs lie. And conditional statements are exactly the same things in our code that makes our code less readable. So if you can avoid conditionals, then uh, at least unnecessary conditionals, right? then you're making your code more readable and more maintainable. Declare variables just before use not only to in order to limit the scope, which is a valid idea, especially in languages like C++, the memory for that local variable will be deallocated soon after it goes out of scope. In C sharp, of course, it's garbage collected, so it'll happen at some other point later in time. But when you read code, if you see the variable being declared just before use, is actually uh, a lot clearer than finding the variables declared somewhere up top in the method and you use it, you know, a whole page later or something. Use var where you, where, where you can, which is uh, the idea is that the compiler is way smarter than the human being and the compiler can inf infer the type almost all the time. It'll complain if it can't. So if it does it doesn't complain, it's able to infer the type. But as a human being, can you infer the type? That might mean you have to change the, on the right hand side, you have to change the method that returns this this value that you're you're assigning to a local variable, change the name of the method to indicate what it is that you're getting back, so you know the type by looking at the method name on the right, and therefore you can use the var. So use var when you can, not all the time. And of course, in some cases you can't, then don't don't force it, or don't force using a var just because you want to use a var. For example, if you look at this case here. Th these could have been var. In fact, there were a var here. You know, so some, sometimes people are driven by saying, I want to use a var, so but I can't set it to null and use the var. So I'll make it a string and I'll give it some value. So now I can use a var. But you're kind of forcing the issue. So don't do not do that. This was actually a var before, but I forgot to change it back to the original code. <laughs> All right. So now what's wrong with this code? Now this is another pet peeve of mine and it, it is to do with costing. As in the as versus costing. It may appear to be subtle to some people, the, the differences, but I'll, I'll try and explain. 
Now this code here is within a for each loop, so you're not seeing that outer outer for each loop. So the, this is the inner for each loop, and there's an outer one here that you're not seeing. So you, there's nothing wrong with this code; it's working. Right? Every, in fact, every code I've shown you so far works. There's nothing; it's not like it doesn't work, but there's still something wrong with it. This to me has a lot of ambiguity. Now it's a simple lines of code, but there's a lot of ambiguity. You're making me wonder a lot about any code like this. One, the first question is as, you're using as, like why? Is it never going to be sometimes? Is there other cases that it's never this code mapping attribute type, or code map mapping attribute array type? And it turns out it's never, it's never, never. <laughs> so it's always. And what I would say is if it's never ambiguous, then don't make it ambiguous by using as. Just cast it. You're showing me your intent. You're saying to me, hey, I, when I wrote this code, I'm pretty sure that that thing is going to cast to this thing. There's no reason for it not to. Right Now, if it occurs that there is an exception, guess what? The exception, the problem doesn't lie in this code. It lies in the code that called it the upstream code. Right? There's something upstream that occurred that made my assumptions here invalid. If my assumptions here are still valid, I won't change it to an as. I'll leave it as a cost because that is showing intent. In this specific case, this, first of all, you're already telling you, telling the method that this is the type you want. And it so happens that this method never returns. Uh, yeah, well, look at this, the null here. So of course, what, what does it null mean? So is it, is this method returning a null? Like when would it return a null? And you see, this is what I'm talking about, asking, you're making me wonder, you're making me think. It turns out that this method never returns a null. So now this check is useless, and you certainly can't write a test for that scenario. And what this method does is it returns an empty array if it can't do what you asked it, what it asked to, or it returns an array with some elements. And it's never not going to be the type. That's just never not going. That's just never going to happen. So <clears throat> this unnecessary ambiguity here of using an as, which tells me you're not quite sure, or you know, it's not not, not quite sure. You're telling me you know that there are cases that it sometimes will cast and sometimes it won't. So what you're really telling me by using an as is you're very aware of the scenarios where it can and can't be that type, or it won't and or will or will not be that type. Right, so that's what you're telling me here, but that's not the case in this specific scenario. So this code cleans up to this. As you can see, the, the as has gone away. I'm casting it to a code mapping attribute array. That condition has disappeared and there's a for each. That's it. Simple, intentful, explicit code. And so knowing that this method never returns and all, and all in .NET, there's the guidelines in case you're not guideline in case you're not aware that says if methods return collections, they should always return either an empty collection or a collection with the elements that were asked for, never a null. So I would just blindly write code like this because this is I know this about .NET since the very beginning. I would not even wonder about nulls. And if the collection is empty, then the, it skips the for each. So right away, code just disappeared and you're showing me your intent very clearly. You're saying this just has to be a code mapping attribute array, and guess what, if it's not, that's wrong. That's not supposed to happen. Therefore, the problem is elsewhere, not here. All right. So this is a case where as is like a valid scenario of using an as. So this method takes in an exception, the base class, and we have what we call business exceptions. So this is like our business exception, the, the top level business exception. And if this excep exception happens to be one of our business exceptions, then we respond with, the, we mark this status as a business, business exception. If not, it's technical. So in other words, any exception in our system, if it's not one of our business exceptions, then it's technical. That means even .NET exceptions are technical. As in anything we don't know, of course, everything in .NET is technical. So that's that's an appropriate use of of as because this exception could be anything. And you're saying, well, if it is this exception or any descendant of this exception, then that will not be null. And then therefore, if it's not null, it's a business exception. 
completely valid use case for an as. Pretty much in any other scenario, as is not a valid case, just cost. Don't be afraid of getting problems because problems indicate that there are other assumptions that are that are flawed or not explicit. So you're getting the opportunity to clean up and remove code from your system rather than just continually adding on code at every step because you're not sure you want to be safe just in case. This is primarily synthetic, so I'll just show you the result. So the name is not clear, the argument name is not clear. And so when I when I look at this method, it's okay, like get what page? Where's the page? What's the string? What is website? Right, so all of these ambiguities have been removed here, but the name makes it clear it's returning an HTML page. Therefore, I was saying get web page HTML. So that's the URL for the web page for which I want to get the HTML. And then this is a typical guidance for anything what I call these technical objects that are not sort of business centric. Just name the variable the local variable the the same as the type with the camel casing. Don't try and invent names. You know, so no need to think hard about inventing a name for these things. Unless these things have a meaning to you. For example, let's say you have two of them in this one method, then one of them means something and the other one means something else. Then you have to kind of think about a name for it. But if it's just one of them and it, it doesn't matter to you what it is, it's pretty clear that this HTTP client is going to go get go to a web page and get you back something, then just name it that. Don't invent names for it. This get async returns a HTTP response message. So instead of calling a response, it's HTTP response message. And the read as a string returns to me a string, but that string to me is the HTML I intend to return. So instead of calling a result, call it HTML. Okay, so simple things, but nonetheless important. So as part of the method design guidelines, formal arguments of a method should be of the least derived type possible for collections and other types uh, collection types sorry prefer interfaces so you know i enumerable i list and such so let's dig a little deeper into this let's say i'm operating on a stream in this form method and in the implementation of this method i actually expect a file stream my signature says it expects a stream so that may work However, you're probably then casting that, that stream argument to a local file stream, right? And it sort of works most of the time. But that's wrong. This, uh, this guideline says, should be of the least derived type possible. So first thing is asking one question, right? And method arguments should be of the least derived types and responses or output, you know, not I don't mean output, sorry, return types of methods should be of the most derived type. That's the basic guidance. Whenever you define methods, a good design says that the arguments should be of the least derived type if there's an opportunity for like a hierarchy. And the return type should be of the most derived type. But of course, when I say least derived type, I mean least derived type possible. So don't sort of force fit it to be a stream just because I said least derived type. Least derived type possible. So if you need a file stream, then say you need a file stream. Don't say you need a stream. That's because internally you're treating it as a file stream in the implementation. When you return, let's say for, for a similar scenario, you're returning something from a stream, and let's say you were operating on a file stream internally to this method, now you have to return that thing, that stream, then type the return type to be a file stream, not a stream. The, the caller can always choose to type your response to a stream if they want to treat everything that comes out of your method as a stream. Yeah, they have the option. They can treat your result as a stream. But on your end, you're saying this method returns a file stream. So it's the most derived type, not the least derived type. So when people hear that, they'll kind of, again, they, they try and beat the system. They say, okay, you know, I'll, I'll say I'm expecting an enumerable but basically I'm expecting an iList. So I'm going to the least derived type. An iNewable is like at a higher level than a iList. So that's that's the lesser derived type. But I actually need a list, so I'm gonna cast it in here and I need to, to add or remove some items from the collection. But then you're, what I call, you're lying to me. And this is not correct, you're lying. You, you're lying that you need an iNewable when you actually, actually need an iList. Now the, 
the thing is this might work you know 90% of the time and then one time it blows up because someone called this method where it was not an i list anymore and you can't cast it right so don't do this right? don't lie about what your method requires when i see a method with, that requires an i enumerable what i understand from it is this this method is going to use my collection and it's simply going to iterate over it it's not going to try and modify it right so that's what an i enumerable means if i see a method requires an i list that's telling me that this method is most likely altering the list other than being able to iterate over the list it intends to alter the list if i'm designing a method that returns an i enumerable then what i'm saying is hey i'm giving you this collection I expect you to just want to iterate over this collection. I'm not giving you the ability to add or remove items from it. I'm only giving you the ability to iterate over it. So if you're trying to hack it and make it an iList, which you can, see, we're all safe in the house. We all trust each other. So nobody's trying to beat the system. My intention is to give you the option, or the only option is to iterate over this collection. I don't expect you to try and modify the list. Right, at least within the system. Now, maybe in the public API side, if you think you have to be extra careful, there are other options in .NET to have read-only collections. But internally, you can sort of trust each other and you're safe. Now, we finally come to the last slide. This is another pet peeve of mine, but it, it, I think they're all, they follow each other. Bool arguments and bool return types. So when methods take on bool. So both of these cases I will suspect. If I see a bool in any in the signature of any uh, of, of a method anywhere in the return type or in the formal arguments, I will suspect that method. And I think nine times out of ten, it doesn't need to be there. And why it's there is because somebody's trying to reuse a method, right? So you're pivoting around that that bool internally. And so you're trying to reuse this method, you know, and you send a bool parameter to indicate it's this condition or this this reason or that reason. And so you pivot around it. Don't do that. Methods should not take on bool parameters. And certainly methods, when they return bools, now of course there are some valid cases, as you've seen in the some of the code examples. If you're encapsulating conditionals that are domain specific, you know, sort of conditionals, then returning a bool makes sense because you're essentially validating a certain business criteria and so you have to return a bool, which is a valid case of returning a bool. But if you're returning a bool to indicate success or failure, that's wrong. Right? So Methods that are similar CCS says that don't do not use bool return types to indicate success or failure for methods that are actions. Right, so don't do this. Methods that take on take in bools as formal arguments, one or more, I would just suspect. It's very rare. I've hardly ever seen the need to have a method that takes on a bool parameter unless I'm trying to actually, you know, reuse this method. Right. Talking about reusability, and this will be the last point in this uh, this video i have this rule of thirds the rule of thirds says if you if you need to copy paste a method again and then you want to kind of tweak it a little bit then do that so first time you've written the method the second time you've copy pasted it and you've tweaked it when it comes to doing it again for the third time right that's when you want to stop and think so now you have three scenarios three probably different scenarios that have occurred where you need a, a version of this method. It, so you also have more insight into what it is that you are going to need because you have three scenarios. That's when you want to sort of think and refactor. And either you, you're you going to have to generalize this method. So the rule of thirds says you need to do this generalization after or when you hit that third attempt or third time you require it. Now don't try and generalize off the, off the top, right off the bat. As I said probably earlier, generalizations, reuse, this whole thing is just adding unnecessary ambiguity in direction uh, into your system. And you're prob probably writing code for something you don't even have a need for today, but you're imagining it. Right? Write code for what you know today. Don't worry about reuse. The reuse comes from understanding the reuse properly. Right? So when you understand the reuse properly, you can always make adjustments to reuse something then. Don't start off imagining a reuse. So the rule of thirds is saying, wait for that third time. When you find yourself having to do this for the third time, now is potentially a good time for you to think about how to refactor this because you have the scenarios and you also have a better understanding of what you need. And most likely it's not even 
some generalized method. It could probably be polymorphism instead. Right? So you're also leaving yourself the ability to rethink the final solution after you had enough experience with all the different scenarios that you encountered thus far, rather than jumping into this reuse and, and regeneralizing a method or using some form of generics to you know solve the problem. So this brings us to the end. I hope I've made you think, I've <laughs> made you wonder, and I'm, I've told you a story. Right? If you if you're thinking and you're wondering, you know, write me a comment. Let's have a discussion. Subscribe, and I'll see you next time.